I put my hand up against his chest. Joe, we've known each other for seven years. We met through my all but official ex-husband. We are halfway naked on my perfectly linen bed. I tell myself, wait, stop. I say stop because I don't know how to do this. Joe is my friend. Christ, he's my ex-husband, Alex's friend, too. We'd had him over for Thanksgiving dinner. The two met at grad school at USC. The three of us watched movies in our living room and ate pizza and collaborated on screenplays. There was no big attraction between us then. I just really liked him. Dating was not in my plan. I had already made that mistake right out of the gate. Alex and I were married for 12 years, but the first week I moved out of the house, my ex-husband started dating a spin instructor named April. So in a huff, I got on Match.com and promptly fell in love with a guy ironically named Joey. After only six weeks, I joined him in Florida for an all-out Disney World vacation. We held hands and watched fireworks, and under the red, blue, green smoke of them, I dreamt of his children becoming my own. Twelve weeks in, he left me. Abandoned me, really. No, not it's over, I'm leaving abandonment, but the other kind, the slow, painful, inexplicable way he began treating me, between the confusing de-evolution -evolu of the words, I love you, to I'm just really busy is all. When Joey left me so abruptly, following the demise of a 12-year marriage, I was ruined, left with three prescriptions and a plane ticket to Ohio to see my family. Joey broke my heart so badly it made me sick. Sick is what I've taken to calling those times when I wake at 5 a.m. and sob till 8 and then sleep again till 11. And sometimes I can take a shower and comb my hair, and sometimes I can't. And I just thank God I don't have a job right now, because how would I go anyway? I came from Ohio after a while, and I tapered off my blue and white pills, and I upped my visits to various health care professionals, and time passed. I promised everyone I would not date for a very long time. But a few months prior to this, I had invited Joe to my birthday party. He gave me a goofy, lingering hug before he left. It was slightly awkward in a wait a minute kind of way. We started making excuses to see each other. I have this extra ticket to this play on Friday. No use crying into our cups on election night alone. That's when it first happened, the kiss, a week prior to this on election night. I wore a red and white polka dotted blouse and a long blue denim skirt with a slit up the side and a lucky silver horseshoe necklace for Obama. It was lucky, all right. Between the champagne pop and the acceptance speech, there was a slow dance to Glenn Miller and a hopelessly broken hem. But we had behaved ourselves. But now there was this night. Joe and I are still half naked on the bed. I'm wearing mesh orange underwear and a lacy teal bra. The moment between my just manicured hands on his smooth chest and his pale cheek thinking what to say next lasts a long time. Here we were at the moment of truth. I had, to my ask, I, did, I had to ask myself, was it really worth it, this risk? The risk of emotional devastation, like with Joey? The strain between my ex-husband and I, killing the dynamic we had both worked so hard to, to attain? The risk of losing a perfectly lovely friendship with Joe. He's all wrapped around me now long runner's legs, and his shoulders are broad and warm, and I'm getting progressively tinglier. What do you want to do? I whisper to Joe. I want all of you, he says. We start kissing again, and I tell him, I don't have anything. <laughs> that was on purpose. I had been doing this, I had almost been doing this granny panty trick, you know, when women purposefully wear their ugliest cotton underwear, maybe even don't shave their legs or tidy up down there to prevent themselves from going further than they intended. I didn't. He says, I have something. Okay, responsible. I like that. I tease him, presumptuous. He tells me it's only because he was an Eagle Scout. <laughs> Always prepared, I say. I tell him I was a Girl Scout, so I'm already thinking, hey, there's some fun role playing we could do. And <laughs> no, that's a lie. I wasn't thinking about some fun role playing. 
I was thinking, great, we'll both be on the same page, that our kids will be scouts. They'll earn activity patches, and in 10 years we'll be sitting together in the back of an auditorium taking pictures of our twins. They'll both get the Wilderness Achievement Badge, and we'll go out for ice cream sundaes afterwards, and we'll let them stay up a whole hour past their bedtime. Once they're asleep, we'll get it on, still hot for each other after all these years. He asked me if he should get them. The condoms. Um, yeah. So he gets up and starts putting on his clothes. What are you doing, I ask. They're in the car, he says. Now what kind of Eagle Scout leaves his condoms in the car? Did he leave his penis out there too? What, was he rationing them? But I'm actually grateful for the time because I lie there and I have a minute to think. And in one moment of what can only be called enlightenment, I realize I don't have to know where this is going. I can just be present and joyful in this evening that's unfolding so beautifully, no matter what shape the relationship takes. Joe moved to New York a few months after. He took a job he'd been offered before we got together. He moved. Who moved on? He left. There's an old saying, if you love someone, let them go. And I did let him go. And no, he isn't here tonight. But he isn't here only because he's at LAX picking up his mother, who's going to spend Easter together with us in our bungalow in Sherman Oaks. I risked my heart. I took the plunge. And it paid off in love. It paid off in love.